pastor, Dr. Reginald Van Stevens. What does it mean to persevere? If I'm calling on you, if I'm encouraging you to persevere, what does it mean to persevere? How is it possible to persevere in the faith given what we have to be faced with today? And all of us are faced with something. All of us are, are tempted by something. All of us, are, 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 the devil is trying to discourage us with something to get us to fall away from the faith. But how is it possible to do it? Regardless of whether you have ongoing hardships or the devil trying to pull you in a different direction or by worldly standards you're comfortable and you honestly have gotten successful because you know there are all kinds of distractions. But how can I persevere, Pastor? First thing you got to be is determined to follow Christ. Don't ever estimate determination. Hold to your Christian convictions. You can do it. The devil says you can't, but yes, you can. You can hold to your Christian convictions. Despite all of the other kinds of things that are designed to discourage you. Even when Jesus was on earth in the flesh, there were some who were first excited about being his disciples. Who eventually decided to distance themselves or fall away from him. Why? Because of the requirements of his words. Let me give you one good example. In John 6... He says, if you won't follow me, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. They said, oh, no. They didn't remain long enough to learn what he meant with his metaphorical expression. He was talking about or teaching about how to have real life and be sustained. In this life's journey. They were just finishing up a talk. If you go back and read John 6. About the manna that God sent down from heaven. To get his people through the wilderness. You got to keep stuff in context. Some people fall away from the faith. Because they don't stay long, around long enough. To find out what you're really talking about. What is really behind it. They take things out of context. And when it's taken out of context, the devil can mess you up. How many people you know have left the church because something they taken out of its context? Its proper context. And, they, and the devil got you just like that. Today, a few fall away because they don't understand completely what they are hearing as simply requirements of the faith. They don't stay long enough to learn what they don't immediately understand because they don't allow the word of God to become deeply rooted in themselves. If you want to stay, you got to be determined. If you want to persevere, you got to be convicted and convinced Welcome to the White Rock Baptist Church Worship Experience. Led by our dynamic pastor, the Reverend Dr. Reginald Van Stevens, we invite you to join us each and every Sunday as we welcome the world to Christ. If you're in Durham, North Carolina, we'd love to have you join us in person on Sundays at 9.15 a.m. for a wonderful time in worship and in the Word. At White Rock, we believe that families are strengthened and lives are transformed through service and proclamation of His Gospel. Our Wednesday seasons of prayer and Bible discovery classes will empower and equip you to serve the Lord. But that's not all. We have dozens of ministries to meet the needs of White Rock members in the surrounding community. Our ministries for children, teens, women, men, and couples enrich the lives of those inside and outside the church. 
White Rock Ministries provide food to those in need, support those dealing with life challenges and grief, and create opportunities to discover and grow in God's collective purpose for our lives. For specific details on our ministries, prayer times, and Bible studies, please visit www.whiterockbaptistchurch.org. Thank you for spending time with us today, and we look forward to seeing you again as we persevere in the faith. Enough for me to smile on me. 
with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Come on, put your hands together for every praise. Oh, every praise, every Yeah, 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing songs of praise to him. For the Lord, he is a great God. Our Lord is a great God. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people he watches over. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, oh, we come this morning where you have called us unto yourself. And God, we come to you with our hearts filled with gratitude and love for you. We gather, Lord, to lift our voices and our hearts in praise and thanksgiving. For you are good. Yes, you, are. you are good. You are good and worthy to be praised. We thank you, God, for the privilege of being able to enter your presence and seek you, to seek you, Lord, one more time in this place. So we join our hearts to you, Lord, and we pray this time of worship will be pleasing unto you. Come now, come now, blessed Savior, and surround us with your spirit. We thank you, Lord, and we bless your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I am pleased now to introduce our youth participant today, Indeed, this is Youth Emphasis Sunday, and I am pleased now to welcome and present to you Miles Haggins Dixon, who will read scripture and offer a prayer. Won't you come, Miles? Good morning. My name is Miles Higgins Dixon. I am pleased to read from the book of Genesis, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. I will read from the New Living Translation. And it reads, The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous. And you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, thy earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from us the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the glory and the power forevermore. Father God, we just thank you for being here and being just that, our Father, Father God. Thank you for just being on earth as it is in heaven, Father God. Thank you for being our peace, our provider, everything that we need. Thank you for being with us, not against us. Because if God is for us, who can be against us? Praise God. Thank you for being Jehovah Jireh, our provider, who gives us everything that we need to succeed and be well in this earth. Father God, we thank you for being Jehovah Nisi, our victory, because if we have victory, we cannot fail. Thank you for being Jehovah Shalom, our Prince of Peace, giving us peace and hope that transcends all understanding. We thank you, Father God, for being with our young people, our everybody, all ages. We thank you for 
these upcoming school years for these children who can learn new things. We thank you for our pastor. We thank you for the ministerial uh, employees who will give the word today. We thank you for everything that you have given us, everything that you have given us, everything that you will give us, and everything that you will do. Lead us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and protect us from dangers seen and unseen. And lead us not against you, but towards you, Father God. Lead us away from the enemy so we may be closer to you. Give us faith like Abraham. Give us courage like David. Give us everything that we need, Father God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
be in the house of the Lord. Amen. The Lord has given us a beautiful Sunday in which to worship Him. And we are here and made our way to worship the great I Am. Thank God for these ministers who are with us today and been serving so faithfully and all those who are serving in various capacities in the ministry of this church and for the wonderful music we've heard already. Let's say amen to the musicians in choir, amen. <laughs> Miles Dixon has done a wonderful job and 
his prayer, his, his reading of scripture. Fine young man, and um, we all are very proud of him and look for great things the Lord will do with his life. I want to pick up where he left off. I had him read just three verses of Genesis 12 from the New Living Translation. I want to continue to read on as it continues just through a few additional verses. Beginning at verse 4 through 9, read, So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot with, went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife, Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all of his wealth, his livestock, and all the people he had taken into his household at Haran, and headed for the land of Canaan. When, he, when they arrived in Canaan, Abram traveled through the land as far as Shechem. There he set up camp beside the Oak of Mare. At that time, the area was inhabited by Canaanites. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give you this land. I will give this land to your descendants. And Abram built an altar there and dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. After that, Abram traveled south and set up camp in hill country with Bethel to the west and I to the east. There he built an, another altar and dedicated it to the Lord and he worshiped the Lord. Then Abram continued traveling south by stages toward the Negev. I end the reading there. I want to entitle this message this morning, The Adventure of a Lifetime. The Adventure of a Lifetime. You probably have heard the expression, nothing ventured, nothing gained. I don't know who coined that phrase, but it may have been inspired by this man in the Bible named Abraham. He's willing to try something different. He's really to do something that he's never experienced before in his life. And when he does, what we discover is how he obviously pleased God. And I think that's what we all really want to do with our life. We really want to please God. But unlike Abram, and we call him Abraham, the reason why so many people today don't gain what the Lord uh, has for them is complacency. They don't actually develop into who the Lord planned them to be as a person because they're just too self-satisfied and they don't see their own deficiencies. Some people have come to a point, even in the early age of life, saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just who I am. I've done enough. I am who I am. And they settle that way. But they are actually very complacent people, and they don't develop into the person that the Lord really planned them to be. And sometimes that complacency, listen, is masked by fear. Some people put up a big front, you know, I'm just who I am, da -da, but they're really just afraid. They have apprehension. They have fear. What are they fear of? It's the fear of the unknown. The fear of being ridiculed. The fear of losing what they have. The fear of failure. Lots of people are unwilling to shift their thinking about a lot of things in life 
because of fear. Complacency. And fear have polarized a lot of people. Complacency and fear have kept a, a lot of people from actually attaining their only and greatest potential. Complacency and fear is why some people never really amount to much in life. Well, in this text, Abram conquers complacency and fear. Now, because of what is going to be a new adventure, he will be known and now is known by multitudes of people around the world as the father of their faith. When you, when you say Abraham to most people, in this country and other countries around the world, they say, he's the father of faith, our faith. Listen, faith will make the difference between having a bland, uneventful, and purposeless life and having a life filled with the kind of adventures that bring glory to God and a level of satisfaction for yourself so that when you die, and we all gonna die, we won't die with regrets. I don't know about you, but I don't wanna look back over my life at my time of transition. I wanna look back over my life when I, I got to the end and look back with regrets and said, I shoulda, I woulda, if. No, Abraham, Abraham demonstrates what faith is as he engages in what I'm calling the adventure of a lifetime. If Abraham could speak to us today, he would say, you know, when I got to the end of my life, I did so with no regrets. So what is it about faith? What is it about faith that can bridge us from having what a lot of people, and I shouldn't say a lot, some people have a, 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 a fearful, they, they, they live a fearful, boring, uneventful existence. What is it about faith that can bridge us from having that kind of existence to having a purposeful life? that pleases God so that when you and I get to the end, we don't die with regrets and unsatisfied. What is it about faith? Well, faith begins with the acceptance of your calling from God. Some people will call this calling from God inspiration from God. But what I need to impress and drive home, and I've been trying to do this for years, is that each and every person has to understand that God has a divine purpose and plan to use you for his glory in this life. We call this a youth-led Sunday, so I have to look at these two young people who are here today, and there's some others going to listen in other places. When I used to go to church, faithfully as a young person, I didn't know what these people were making a big deal about life and how you chart life out. I didn't get it. I didn't understand it because I was young. Because I'd always been told that the purpose for living is to make a good living. But the people in the church, the people of God were trying to teach me that your life is more than that. Your, your, your real purpose in life is to learn how to please God. To get your satisfaction in life is to know 
that you in the will of God. Well, I need to tell you that Abram's willingness to make a change, and I'm talking about everybody now, not just these young people and others, his willingness to make a change in his life is not because he's bored. I ask people sometimes, why do you change, move from here to over there? What did you do? And really what it came down to was boredom. But that's not what makes Abraham make the change. It's not because he's bored or that life for him has become routine or if it's not even because he's ambitious. No. He's urged by God. You know, when we talk about calling, calling, I listen to people talk about calling. I was, I was in a school for years, 17 years teaching and, and seminary in particular, and I tried to get people to tell me why do you know God called you to something? And you know, you hear all kinds of, 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 of stories because God doesn't call everybody the same way. Some people say, well, you know, I heard the voice of God. Other people say, I had a divine unction. I had something that God kept putting in my spirit and I just couldn't get away from it. Or others saw the urging is through other people. You know, people kept telling me I look like a preacher. I said, you need to go back and tell that person. <laughs> you me check your, your divine credentials. Just because you look like a preacher don't mean you can be that. Or you got a voice like a preacher. Or you stand like a preacher. You walk like a preacher. And people will push you in the pulpit in places. And you'll find out later in the Bible there are some people who went that God didn't send. Somebody help me preach right now. But everybody's not called to be a preacher. Everybody is not called to stand in a pulpit. But everybody has a divine purpose. Everybody has a divine purpose and a plan that God has to use you to bring glory in this life. And, and I need to be clear that this purpose is not always just the same as your occupation. And let me explain what I mean. The occupation is an activity that serves as one's regular resource for your livelihood. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a painter. I'm an education instructor instructor. I'm in the medical field. I'm a firefighter. I'm an entrepreneur, an entertainer. I'm a repair technician and so forth and so on. Or you may have an interest or a talent in certain areas of life. No, your occupation is really just simply something that provides a regular resource for your livelihood. I'm talking about something more than your occupation. God may have given you a particular talent to do things well. And sometimes it's intertwined with the divine purpose. But no, sometimes your divine purpose has nothing or very little to do with your occupation. And I, I can say this because I noticed that Abram was already, listen, Abram was already very successful as a local and prosperous rancher and shepherd, raising livestock and farm land. He was already rich before God called him. Had nothing to do with his occupation. Now, I might 
say he may have been the recipient of what we call today generational wealth. I noticed that the Bible points out the fact of who his father was, Terah. You read about Terah in the chapter 11, beginning at verse 27 through 32. And it tells you all about Terah. And it mentions Terah for a reason. This is Terah's son, which suggests that maybe Terah had handed down something to Abraham. But my question is, why Abram? It cannot just be about God want to make him rich. He's already got a lot of stuff. And parenthetically, I want to tell you something. That blows a big hole in this theological notion by many American preachers that the gospel is fundamentally here to make us materially wealthy. That blows a hole in that. You got churches that are filled up or gathering spaces that are filled up because that minister, that preacher is up there telling you that God's fundamental reason for blessing you is to make you wealthy. That's a hole in that theology right there because God already called, some, called somebody who had already was wealthy. Now, a lot of y'all didn't holler amen on that. Because, you see, they've drilled into the psyche of the American soul that the goal in life is to have wealth materially. They've been successful in making you believe that there's a direct correlation between your religion and your money. And it's not that God doesn't want you to have anything. In fact... I find it interesting that God called somebody who was already wealthy. Well, there's a reason for that too. But that's not the reason that God called Abram. And wealth was not the reason that God, or rather Abram, responded to God. So this theological notion that some of these preachers are out here talk about health, wealth, and so forth. No, Abram is an example that the word of God is much richer than simple materialism. Let me say that again. The word of God is much richer than simple materialism. I mean, you know, you can be you can you can be a billionaire and not worth a dime. I don't want to get distracted, so I'm gonna move on. But what if? This man named Abram, as he's introduced in Genesis 12, verse 1, had been afraid of adventure or change in the way he had been accustomed to living his life and unwilling to change his, his thinking, gotten so comfortable. He would have probably been just another human being who lived and died and forgotten in the dustbin of history. You know, usually when we think of people who are afraid to adventure into another phase of life, it's a teenager or a young adult who just can't get them out the house, they won't leave home. You know, it, you're you going to leave here. You're going to go. <laughs> you're going to go to college. You're going to go somewhere. But they got used to that free satellite service. Somebody paying for the phone. Lights are on. Don't have to buy food. Don't have to do anything. You know how it was when we were living at home? You remember when we were, we were at the home and Mama, Daddy said, now when you get a certain age, you're going to leave here. And our 
expression changed from being resentful and resistant to, oh, daddy, mommy, I love you. But usually when we think of people afraid, we think of teenagers and young adults who lived at home with parents. Or we think about people who are forced to adjust to changing life situations. They get afraid because they've just been separated from the other spouse who's providing the bulk of the income. Or divorce. Or even death had come into that family and the primary earner is gone. But this, I notice, is an older person who is by his own cultural standards, he's very successful and he's got a good solid marriage with Sarah. He's established in his community, in his town. Everybody knows him. He's very comfortable, well-respected, influential in his community and in his country. We can surmise that his father, Tara, taught him more about God than he did about wealth. I wish every parent was like that. I wish every grandparent was like that. I wish people who made up this congregation were like that. I've known a, num a number of families in this church over the 30 years I've been here. And some of them still didn't get the fact that you got to teach your children more about the Lord than you can about or you should about just making a living and becoming somebody that they say can earn a good living or wealth. I've noticed the values that we instill in young people. There are some excellent parents in this church. I've noticed that over 30 years. There's some excellent parents. I wish I had a list that I could name over this time I have for this message today. I, the list would be long over 30 years. Parents who have just instilled in the importance of coming to know Lord, the Lord and having the Lord take hold of your life as a priority over everything else that you encounter in this adventure. And that's what life is. It's an adventure. It's an adventure. It's not just having a destination you're trying to get to. It's an adventure. So I surmise that Tara taught Abram more than about God than he did about wealth. Let me ask you all something. Would you want the kind of kids you have to tell their whole lives what clothes to wear? Or to take these classes or go to that school, apply for this job or that job, marry that person, purchase that house. Or you can always do what they have to do, what you tell them to do as long as they live. No, you don't want that. Why? Because your main goal is that they become people of great character and judgment. <laughs> Tara must have done a very good job in raising Abram because now Abram is in the position where he has to make a decision and the right decision. God is calling you. You have great wealth but God is calling. You have importance in this community, but God is calling you. People see that you have materially become very successful, but God is calling you. His father taught him more about God than about wealth. Here's what Deuteronomy 8 verse 18 says. God was telling through Moses to people 
who he had brought out of Egypt, that they're about to go into the land that he had already reserved for them. And here's what Moses said. But remember the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirm his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. It is God who gives you the ability to produce wealth. So don't go around bragging about what you got. I was reading in the studying my my morning devotions as I was reading uh, this past week I was reading book of Ecclesiastes it was saying something close to the scripture that I'm just I just read to you hearing where God is always talking about wealth and one of the things that Ecclesiastes writer wrote and I didn't particularly remember the verse but he in two places he talked about having wealth and he, and he talks about wealth as something that is the gift from God. But then in another place, he says, having wealth, but not having the ability to enjoy it is vanity. So when God gives you the blessings, and give you the opportunity to enjoy it. Give God the praise. Because there are a whole lot of people who have a lot of wealth. But they can't enjoy it. They don't sleep well at night. Or they're physically unable to really appreciate and enjoy anything because they're preoccupied with the pain in their body. The disease in their body. So there's nothing that they can rejoice about even while they have a great deal of wealth. So no, 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 no. Remember the Lord your God who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And I might add the Ecclesiastic writer says, and to enjoy it. But no, in this text, this has more to do with a spiritual purpose that plants a seed which will also give you a fruitful future that goes beyond the blessings of material things. Abram is able to discern that God is speaking to him about his life. Hmm. He has to make a decision about his future. My future? I'm 75. Sam, you just had a birthday. Did a beautiful job in vacation Bible school the other night, telling everybody your age. Deacon Harrison did an excellent job in making a presentation to us the other night along with Dr. Perry. And I told him, I got all his material. I'll be preaching it on the third Sunday in September. But Sam was talking about his age. And I told my wife later about it. I said, you know, Sam Harrison gave a great presentation. And he told us his age. That dude looks good to be his age. <laughs> Mine is sharp. I wish I could, just, just me and him was in this room. I'd say, now, Sam, now, what if God came to you? Said, now, Sam, I got a bunch of other stuff I want you to do. I don't know what his response might be, but like many of us, <laughs> you get past a certain point, you say, God, are you serious? <laughs> so Abram, Abram was 75. Seventy-five. And he sets a great example for a much, much younger generation. He, a 75-year-old man sets a great example for these young people, this young lady right there, that young man right there. God calls you to something greater than what this world is saying you need to be all about. The Bible teaches us 
to walk by faith and not by sight. Where is that, Pastor? It's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. We walk by faith. We don't walk by sight. And there's a reason for it. Because life is about an adventure. I'm going to tell you about that in this part of the message. Because the next thing I want you to know is faith is followed by clear instructions without prolonged delay. It's a calling from God, but God doesn't just call you without telling you what he wants. And Abram follows these instructions without prolonged delay. Notice he doesn't need to know every detail about the ups and downs of life. Nowhere in the text when the Bible says, Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, your family's father, your father's family, and go to the land I will show you. Nowhere after the period does the Bible say, Abram says, uh, but I uh, got a few questions for you. Lord, I hear what you're saying. I hear you calling me. I, I, I hear you feel, I feel you. I feel you. That, that, that's how we talk. I feel you, Lord. I feel you. I feel you. But before I do anything, can you answer a few questions for me? I used to tell a story. I'm trying not to keep telling that same old story because, you know, when you've been preaching a long time, you end up repeating yourself so much. But I keep telling people all the time, I'm so glad I did what God called me to do because I responded immediately without the questions. And, and you may have similar story and testimony as I'm about to give because if God told us everything we were about to experience following his call of his purpose in our life, many of us would be, you got to find somebody else. Many of us would have said, Lord, what about Chris? He ain't doing nothing. Anybody but me. But that's not what Abram does. He does not have apprehension. He does not worry that something unpleasant or bad might happen. He does not have concrete answers. The text says at verse 4, chapter 12, so Abram departed as the Lord had instructed. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. Abraham, as we came to know him, believed God, in quotes. So he obeyed God. He never asked God for proof before he did what God said. You know, there is this syndrome called failure to launch. It's experienced by people who feel insecure about their future. They never get to the place in life where they feel ready. So they miss out on opportunities. But feeling ready is really overvalued. Remember, we walk by faith and not by sight. You know, people talk about feeling ready. You, you never be a champion if you never run until you get ready. I was watching the Olympics last. I had a great time watching the Olympics. 
And, and I was listening to an interview by uh, Sidney McLaughlin Leveron, an Olympic champion. And she was in an interview, and they were talking to her about these races she was running, competing. I said, were you ready to run all of these races? She said, ready? She said, no. She said, I knew before I started, it was going to hurt. But so was everybody else in the race. Life isn't always easy. Sometimes you got to know before you run, it's going to hurt. So some people don't make strides. Some people never get started, never strike out. Never move, never reach their potential because they're so far afraid. It's going to hurt. They're going to be a problem. Who among us who is successful can say, I, I, I never had a problem. I never had to experience any downside, no pain. Nobody who, who's wearing the gold around their neck hasn't had to feel the challenge. Hebrews 11 verse 8 says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go to a place he would later receive, as in his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Romans chapter 4 verse 3 says, what does the scripture say? Abraham, listen, believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. What is righteousness? People throw that word around a lot, righteousness. What is righteousness? It's actually doing what God says and not simply believing God said it. Let me repeat that because some people don't get things the first time. Righteousness is actually doing what God says and not simply believing God said it. There are a lot of people who believe God but they're not righteous. They know God said it. And it applies to them, not their brothers or sisters or their friends or acquaintances. It applies to you. But righteousness means I know God said it, I believe it, and I'm going to do it. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8, as well as James 2, verse 23, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. This is akin to what Jesus is teaching in his disciples. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, but he didn't leave it there, and his righteousness. Jesus taught us Seek first the kingdom of God, but he didn't leave it there. And his righteousness as a prerequisite to all these things being added in your life. When we read further about Abraham in the Genesis, we will see in his adventures, he was courageous in the rescue of his nephew Lot. If you read further in Genesis, you'll notice he was he passed the test when he was told by God to sacrifice Isaac, his only son. However, Abram was not without his faults or his mistakes. He was impatient at times, especially when the famine made food scarce. 
His instinct was to tell half-truths under pressure. You remember when he got to Egypt because he was trying to find food? He was willing to compromise his wife due to his insecurity. So he told a half-truth, and I call it a half-truth because Genesis 20 Verse 12 reveals that Sarai was, was his half-sister. They had the same father, not the same mother. So he did what a lot of people do when they're under pressure. He told a half-truth. I'm going to give him credit. Because there's some people today we listen to, they straight up lie every day. Liar, liar, pants on fire. How do you know the truth? It's the opposite of what came out of his mouth. So faith, so faith, listen, faith is not without its challenges. Abram wasn't a perfect person. You're not going to have a life adventure and be a perfect person person all of us got a testimony that's why we have Jesus as our intercessor in prayer that's why we have Jesus as our redeemer because all of us need forgiveness of our sins All of us have some times in our life where we come short. All of us in the adventure of life have fallen beneath the standard that God set for us. All of us have needed to be blotted by the blood of Jesus. Do I have a witness in here? All of us celebrate the grace that God has given us. What is grace? Grace is that gap between where God expects us to be and where we have gone. We missed the mark. Sin. Abraham was not perfect in his adventure in life. So faith is not without life challenges. However, faith allows God to assure you that he is with you through your unstable times. God is with you in your ups and when you're down. God is with you when you make mistakes, flaws. If we confess our sin, he's faithful. Somebody say he's faithful. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I got to stick a hallelujah in there. Oh, if it had not been for the forgiveness of God. If it had not been for the grace of God. I couldn't be in this pulpit. You couldn't be in that choir stand. You couldn't sit on this rostrum. You wouldn't be in that pew saying I'm saved and I know I'm saved through the blood of Jesus. Can you imagine what life would be like and feel like without evidence of God's spirit alongside you? The devil would crush your hopes and your dreams. The devil would cause you to fret over every little thing and eventually give up and you would give in to him because you're not perfect, because you didn't live a perfect life. The devil will crush you. But thanks be unto God. God is with you. His spirit will come and minister to you. Yes, he will. He'll pick you up, turn you around. He'll set your feet on solid ground. That's why I sing on Christ. Solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. 
God will assure you he's with you through unstable times. You remember Joseph? Joseph in Genesis chapter 37, the dream God gave him was the revealing of his future. It was an adventure of a lifetime. He was so excited, so excited about what God had told him that he was going to do with his life that he told his family about it. But because of his dream, he was betrayed by his own brothers. He later found himself in trouble because he was lied on by a desperate woman and wrongly imprisoned. But God, God's spirit, God's spirit remained with him. And when you read his story, throughout it, you will see the writer put in there, but the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord's spirit remained with him. God put a cupbearer alongside Joseph while he was in jail, who would eventually bear witness of his gifts to the king. His deliverance from his prison led him to the king's palace and power. Faith! I'm just trying to tell you, is following God's instructions without apprehensions because you know his spirit will be there. Oh, yes. What I'm trying to say to you today, that the way you bridge from an unproductive and purposeless life to a life that pleases God is responding to the call of God, following his clear instructions. And in this adventure in life, you will have your ups and downs. But I'm so glad that his spirit will stay with you. And lastly, let me tell you, faith expects God to keep his promises. God said, let me read it here. God said, leave your native country, relatives and friends, and go to that land that I will show you. Here's the promise. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and will be with you a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt and all the families on the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram believed God and he obeyed. Notice verse 7 and 8. He expected God to keep his promise. So in verse 7 and 8, I noticed something about him. Abram just kept building altars. Did you see it there? Yeah. In verse 7, yeah. the Lord appeared to Abraham, or Abram. I will give you the land to, I will give this land to your descendants. And it says here, and Abram built an altar and dedicated to the Lord. Yeah. Verse 8, after that, he traveled south set up camp in the hill country. There he built another altar and dedicated to the Lord and he worshiped the Lord. What I'm trying to tell you about this man, he worshiped God throughout all of his life adventures. You see, altar construction requires slowing down and taking time to spend with the Lord. He worshiped the Lord. And if you want to be successful, you got to make a habit of worshiping the Lord. Nowadays, the younger generations seem to be in a hurry. They're fast-paced. Several of them impatient. 
and end up usually going nowhere, like running in place. And when I was reading an article just the other day, the article says that surveys are revealing that more and more people in America are becoming less religious. Fewer and fewer people are attending church regularly, if at all. Instead, they just expect comfort and riches to be there in all. But my Bible teaches me that if you ever want life to be a life of success, if you ever want your life to be productive and purposeful and a life that pleases God so that when your day comes to leave here, you won't leave with regrets. You'll leave here satisfied. Abraham is a great example of someone who knew that when you keep on offering God praises and glorify him, he'll keep his promises. I don't have to ask Abraham that. Is there anybody here who would join me in bearing witness that if you keep on praising God, he will keep every one of his promises. Do I have a witness here? Has he ever promised you anything? I don't know about you, but I keep coming week after week, throwing up both my hands and giving praise to God. Abraham kept building altars everywhere he went because he knew that God will fulfill his promises. Well, I want you to know something. When things get rough, he'll be there for you. When things get tough, he'll bring you through because Jesus came through the sea of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and Mary, and Joseph, and 14 generations. Come here, John. John said in John 8, 56, Jesus said, Abraham, rejoice to see my day. He saw it. And he was glad. And I was raising questions to myself. What did Jesus mean when he said, Abraham rejoiced? Saw my day. And he was glad. Well, what did he see? And why was he glad? Well, he saw. He saw the Lord give up his life for all of us on the cross he saw you and I would have our ups and downs he saw we need the blood shed for our sins he saw that God sent like Isaac his only son he saw that there was deliverance because of obedience there was a sacrifice on the altar of the cross he saw the Lord Jesus give up his life for all of us on the cross why was he glad when Jesus died when the blood was shed when the tomb was shut why was he glad he was glad because early I said early he was glad because early on a Sunday morning I'm glad that on Sunday morning Jesus got up with all power in heaven and earth in his hand now 
Abraham anticipated. He anticipated a resurrection. We are glad today because Jesus made it possible for us to get to that city that Abraham was seeking. I don't know about you, but Abraham was looking for a beautiful place. He was looking for a place not made with human hands. Eternal in the heavens. I want to close the day to tell you to keep on walking by faith. Keep on walking today believing in Jesus. Faith in the Lord Jesus will save you. Faith in Christ Jesus will bring blessings in your life. Faith in Christ Jesus will give your soul eternal life. God, oh God, will give you exceedingly more than what you ask for when you walk by faith. It's the adventure of a lifetime. When God says go, ask God where. And where God says, I'm on my way. I'm on my way somewhere right now. I'm on my way to a place called heaven. I'm on my way to pleasing God. I'm not what I want to be, but I thank God I'm not who I used to be. God's grace, God's mercy, and God's power has led me to stand on the rock and declare he saves. Yes, he is. He's a mighty good savior. Yes, he is. He's a mighty good redeemer. Yes, he is. He'll hike you by your hand, hold you up, strengthen you, give you joy, give you peace, make you satisfied. Somebody say yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. He's a good God. Ain't he good? Throw your hand up, say. God, I thank you for pulling me. Thank you for putting me on a rock. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's an adventure of a lifetime. Abraham, Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. He, he didn't do what God said because he was bored. He didn't move from one place to the other because it was routine and he just got tired of listening to that same old stuff. No. No. Some people are like tumbleweeds. They're just blowing from place to place aimlessly and purposelessly. But no, when God calls you, he's got a plan and a purpose for your life. A plan that brings him pleasure, him glory. So that when you leave here, you won't leave with regrets. I don't know about you, when I get to heaven, I want to hear the Lord say, well done. Good and faithful servant. You've been faithful. Over a few things, I want to have you enter into my joy. So Abraham 
departed. Not knowing where he was going, but he knew God was there. Wherever it was, God was there. Through his ups and down and through his down. But one thing he knew, God would keep his promise. And I'm here to tell somebody today, God is going to keep his promise. Whatever God promises in your life, he'll keep you. He'll keep that promise to you. I'm going to extend an invitation to Christian discipleship through Christ Jesus. If you don't have him as your savior, your deliverer, I want to have you by faith receive the Lord Christ with a confession of your mouth and believing in your heart. God raised him, sent him to die for your sins and raised him from the dead and he's alive and sitting on the right hand acting as your intercessor making sure that the Father fulfills every promise Holy Spirit says I'll be with you through every walk every turn even when life gets tough even when life gets tough and uncertain Spirit of God says I'll be there with you I'll be there with you. If you don't have a church home, if you don't have a place where you're going and growing in Christ, in the Word of God, come on and be a part of the White Rock Church in Durham, North Carolina. Don't fail to go. Don't fail to move. Don't fail to do as the Lord has called you to. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. just want to thank here's my verse you've been so good been. you've been so good oh you've been so good been so good, you've been so Sometimes I just have to get by myself and throw my hands up. I just want to thank you. You saved my soul and then I'm gone. You saved my soul. You saved my when this earthly tabernacle is dissolved we have another building not made with human hands human hands eternal in the heaven so you save my soul when I'm absent from the body I'm present with the Lord you save my soul if I had 10,000 tongues I'll praise you with everyone. I'll lift my eyes to the hills from which cometh my help because my help comes from the Lord. I just want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Amen. We thank God for that awesome word from our pastor, the adventure of a lifetime. Amen. At this time of our service, we will have our tithes and our offering. And we have a variety of ways that you can contribute your offering on today. If you're here with us in person, we have two baskets up here to my right and my left that you can come and bring your offering. Um, we also have online options, whether it's through PayPal, whether it's through Givelify, or your own banking system. Um, we also have a, a church trustee or deacon who will come to you and get your offering. And, and you also can mail your church um, contribution in to us. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you that we're on the adventure of a lifetime. So, dear Lord, we pray that you will be with us today. That in our giving, Lord, that we, that we will also celebrate you. So bless those who have to give and bless those who do not have to give. And Lord, we give you all honor and praise because it belongs to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may come at this time. church say amen. amen praise God I just want to stand before you to remind you and to inform you and to for all of us to get ready to celebrate as our pastor birthday is on the 5th of September the 5th of September so we have a few more Sundays we will come together with presenting gifts on the second Sunday which is on the 8th for the past of September but you have the baskets already out, so you can start just dropping whatever the Lord would have you to do. But just wanted to make sure everyone understood that we are celebrating our pastor's birthday on the second Sunday in September. But his birthday is on the 5th, so feel free to say happy birthday starting in September and the entire month. God bless you. Thank you. Let the church... Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. If you need a healing, he'll heal you. Let the church say, let the church. If your life needs new direction, say amen. If you need a blessing, let the church. 
One more time. Oh, let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. And now may the grace of God, who is our divine creator, and the love of Jesus Christ, who is our Savior, and the abiding presence of his Holy Spirit go with us to bless us. Bless us with his protection. Bless us with his prosperity. And bless us with his peace, now and evermore. And let the church together sing, amen. 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 Our Father, we just come before you thanking you for being just that, our Father. We thank you for these children, Father God. We thank you for protecting these children, guiding these children each and every way, guiding their path, being the light of their path. We thank you for being in my life and in all these children's lives. Mm -hmm. We thank you for these people that are in our lives, protecting us. We thank you for these adults that protect our children, that raise our children to be what you want us to be, Father God. Yes. We thank you for being in our lives, Father God, for yes. being what you want to be. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Father God, for giving us your mercy, brand new mercy each and every day, Father God. Yes. We thank you for being a graceful God, yes. a gracious God, yes. and a loving God above yes. all else. Let us be like little children, as it says in your word. Mm -hmm. Believe like a little child, because they will believe it everything that you will tell us to do. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Father God, for being our rock, yes. our sword, our shield to go into battle yes. against the enemy. Yes, Lord. We pray for our elections, Father God, yes. that we may get the right person. Yes. We know that we don't know what's going to happen, no. but we know that you have the final say, Father yes. God. Yes. You are the Alpha and the Omega, Father God, yes. the first and the last, beginning and the end. You have all power over everything, Father yes. God. It is not the person in office mm -hmm. that has power, but you have power over them, yes, Father Lord. God. Yes, Lord. You are the one that rules over everything, yes, over Lord. everyone, Father God. Yes. We thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Yes, Amen. Lord. I will be reading from Mark 9, uh, chapter 9, 37, and it reads, Anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes not only me, but also my Father who sent me. Dear Lord, please look over all the children. Please look over everybody that's starting school soon. Look over all of the people that have uh, sports, have clubs, activities, Please help them stay safe. Um, at the Jamboree yesterday, uh, somebody pulled out a weapon. Please keep everybody safe when they're out at activities, families too. Please help that everybody can stay, keep their body nourished and healthy so that they can come out every single day and be a good kid and uh, be able to live the experience that they should as a child. Please help everybody get ready for um, if, when they're becoming a senior, uh, please help them get ready to look at the colleges and that they set up their future well. Yes. Please help them have a guide that helps them, counselors, teachers. 
Please help them teach to the best of their ability so that the kids can learn all that they can learn. Because education, we need it. We really do need it. God, you are the only provider of that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before we leave, I understand that Sister Spivey was taken to the hospital from here, so we want to offer a word of prayer for her. We lift up our eyes into the hills from which cometh our help. Yes, Lord. For we know all of our help comes mm -hmm. from you, Lord. Oh, yes, Father. Father, we bow before you this morning, right now, God, right now, Lord. on behalf of Deaconess Spivey. Yes, Lord. God, I thank you, O Heavenly Father, that she was here in the house of God, Lord, that had saints around her, O God. I thank you, Lord, for bringing her here safely this morning, God. But God, we're calling on your healing hands right now to touch her, Lord. We don't know what the situation is, God, but we know that you do. Yes. So, God, we pray that you will intervene, God. Right you now, will God. heal her body of whatever yes. the need is, oh, God. Yes, I pray, Lord. Lord, that those that are attending to her, God, that you will give them the wisdom and knowledge, yes. Father, yes, because yes. you created her, God. You yes. know what she needs, oh, Heavenly yes. Father. Yes. So, God, we're just going to thank you right now for your Lord. healing. We want to thank you right now, Lord, thank for those God. that are attending to her. Yes. We want to thank you right now, Lord, those for, that were in the sanctuary this morning that came to her yes. need. We yes. want to thank Thank you right now, Jesus, Lord. for all that you have done, not yes. only for her, but yes. for all of us. Yes. And God, we shall continue to give you the glory, praise to give God. you the praise, Lord. Yes. And we shall wait on the yes. testimony of how you have healed Sister Spivey. Thank God, you. I thank you and we thank praise you. you right now. Lord, we don't have to wait to see the blessing. We're going to praise you Hallelujah. right now. In Hallelujah. the name of your son, Jesus, Jesus, we pray. Thank amen you. and amen. amen. Thank you for joining our worship experience. We look forward to seeing you again online next Sunday or in person at 915 in our sanctuary at 3400 Fayetteville Street, Durham, North Carolina. For information about White Rock Baptist Church, please visit our website at www.whiterockbaptistchurch.org or contact the church office at 919-688-8136. Until next time, May Christ Jesus continue to bless you and keep you until we meet again.